Far out in the vastness of space, deep inside the Earth's molten core, beyond the confines of time, of reality, of imagination, this is where you'll find us. These are the Worlds of Tomorrow. to Worlds of Tomorrow. Uh, my name is Kyle Anderson. Thank you for listening to this. this is the second episode. This is going to be uh, a commentary, as I talked about on the first episode, the first little short episode. Um, and that's kind of how this is going to work. It's going to be kind of an episode where I just talk about something or I have a guest to talk about something, and then there will be commentary episodes. There might be other things involved. I want to keep this as open as our ideas about the future. Um, which is one of the dumber things I've ever said. But so today's going to be a commentary of uh, Battle Beyond the Stars. I have included in the show notes to this a link to the uh, the Shmoo Shmoob video, since I am not representing anybody. Um, a video that is up on that website that you can watch stuff, um, and that'll be the one that I'm going to be using. I'm watching a Blu-ray currently, but um, the one that has the same time. It's basically what I'm looking for. So um, everybody queue up, or if you have the Blu-ray, that'd be great, or the DVD or whatever. If you have a VHS copy of Battle Beyond the Stars from back in the early 80s, that'd be great too. So we're going to go ahead and get started here, um, and I'll just, we'll, we'll kind of talk along, and hopefully this is interesting to you. This is the first time I've ever tried a solo commentary. If it's terrible, I'll know it, because I don't think I'm that great. But anyway, so... Um, Everybody have your videos ready, not legally purchased, but possibly legally purchased. And uh, I'm going to go in 3, 2, 1, play. 3, 2, 1, play. Uh, so, yep, New World Pictures. This is a Roger Corman production. This is famously uh, his most expensive production to date, um, or up to that point, which was, I think, estimates are roughly around $2 million, which is so paltry compared to some other movies, um, especially movies of this nature this was a very lofty uh idea for a film a lofty goal to set for himself to kind of be like i mean because roger corman's new world pictures had basically just been uh let's see who we can rip off rip off's a horrible word but let's it, they're exploitation movies they're exploiting people's love of x and in this case x was star wars um this came out in 1980 the same year as empire strikes back but it was still basically on the heels of star wars um obviously you can see the starfield uh opening you can see and it's got the big bombastic score i'll talk about that a little bit that's um uh, uh oh my gosh uh the great james horner um who sadly has passed away um only fairly recently um this is one of his better scores it's a really great score um a good companion to his 1982 score for star trek the uh the wrath of khan um if you can find the score for this, the soundtrack, and just listen to it. It's really great. It's some really good sci-fi music. Um, and he was doing some really interesting things. There's also some cool sound effects on the soundtrack album by uh, Alan Holzman, who is one of um, John Carpenter's collaborators on his various scores. Um, so like I was saying, uh, Roger Corman, this is his most expensive film to date, uh, $2 million. It made $7.5 million, which to Roger Corman is... Uh, you know, that's great. I mean, to anybody, that's more than twice your budget, more than three times your budget, um, which is all anybody can want. And that's kind of what Roger Corman did. He made these low budget things that people would go see, not a ton of people, but people would go see, but enough people so that he made money. Um, there's a story that Richard Thomas, the star of this film, tells, um, which is when he was on set for the first time and he saw the big, huge, um, you know, soundstage. Uh, Corman had bought a a lumber yard in Venice, California, and basically turned it into uh, a soundstage for this, and then subsequently used it on other things. Um, but Richard Thomas came and stood and and saw uh, the big, huge production, and and said, "Oh boy, I hope this movie makes money." And then one of the assistants there was said, "Oh, Mr. Corman doesn't do anything if it doesn't make money." So obviously, he knew it was going to make some money. 
um, which this did. The, this opening shot here, um, you can see it's very reminiscent of Star Wars. Instead of going under it, under the sh big ship, we're going around the side of it, which is actually a really great shot. Um, the special effects in this were done by James Cameron, among other people, but James Cameron was the art director, and I believe the special effects, the, the model builder uh, head. Um, and so we get now the interior of the ship, and this is where you can kind of see the the limitations, I guess. Um, the set, the the models, I think, look really great, but the sets don't always look great. Um, you can see the, the black floor, which is something fans of Doctor Who <laughs> know very well. Um, but these model shots, I think, look really great. They've come to the planet Akir, which is, of course, a uh, reference, and the, the people on the planet are called the Akira, which is uh, absolutely a reference to Akira Kurosawa, who's filmed Seven Samurai, um, was the basis for this film, and The Magnificent Seven, which this is kind of closer tied to. But Corman said, I think we should do a sci-fi version of Seven Samurai. And, you know, this is basically what that is. And John Sayles, who was a young screenwriter, who is now, you know, Oscar-nominated, I believe, and has done quite a lot of other things, this was his screenplay, and he added a lot of humor to it. It's it's very tongue-in-cheek, um, and I think that really works to its advantage. Um, one thing I'm going to talk about later on is that uh, I think this movie is a lot of fun. I don't think it's a great movie. I think it's a, a movie that I enjoy watching, and that's kind of what I was talking about in the last episode, is that sci-fi just is something that makes me feel like a kid. Even though I didn't see this movie until I was an adult, it just kind of makes me feel like, I, like a kid again. Um that said, I don't think everything in it works, and um, I want, you know, I want to be able to to take the good and the bad. As uh, Mrs. Garrett said, those are the facts of life. Um, I think this is the planet Akir. I think it's an interesting concept, but I don't think it looks particularly great. I mean, it's kind of Adobe looking. Um, there's Richard Thomas there on the right. He, of course, from... Um, the Waltons. He had just been on The Waltons for about it seven years, and right before this, he was on a TV movie a remake of All Quiet on the Western Front. So he'd not been in a lot of films. He still hasn't really been in a lot of theatrical films, but he was in a ton of television. Um, and there we see the head of John Saxon, who was our our villain for the film, and uh, Sador. He's uh, John Saxon is is B movie royalty. Um, if you've seen any movie from the 80s really he played the the dad slash sheriff in a nightmare on elm street he was the the white guy in uh enter the dragon alongside bruce lee and jim kelly and uh he he's he knows exactly what kind of movie he's in he usually plays a bad guy um but i think he's really good in this and sador is an interesting character that we'll get into in a little bit later but he tries to perpetuate his life by grafting on pieces of other species onto himself to kind of just keep replenishing his his body, um, which is such a weird idea. I don't actually think it would work, but much the same way that uh, in Seven Samurai or The Magnificent Seven, the bad guy comes in at the beginning and says, give me what I want, which is in Magnificent Seven, it's food, and I think it's also food in Seven Samurai, um, you dumb, stupid people on a farm, or I will... Uh, kill you. I, you have two weeks to get your stuff in order. And in this, he wants to take over the planet, um, enslave everybody. And so for just no reason, he's just, as a show of force, he's zapping people uh, willy-nilly, which is not great, but that's a, it's a good way for your villain to come in and just be, just be an a-hole. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting also to note that Sador's crew is entirely pig-looking mutant people. Um, I don't know why it's interesting to note that, other than he likes to <laughs> anybody who's better than him. He's probably grafted onto himself um, in some way. Um, and look at the, the lighting in this, the blue and the green and that little f fleck of orange that really is like signifies bad guys. Uh, the director of this movie, Jimmy Murakami, had done mostly animation and continued to do mostly animation after this. Um, he There's not much information about Jimmy Murakami uh, and there's some reports that Corman himself directed a lot of the film um, because it was his money, basically, and he wanted to make sure everybody was was on track, um, which sort of leads to part of the downfall toward the, the later part of the film. But um, So here we have the, the, the council, I guess, of Akir trying to decide what to do. What are we going to do about this guy? And uh, Zed here, the blind um, elder, He's sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi-ish, but he he doesn't do it that much, to be fair. Um, but he's the one who said, we should fight, even though the Akira are very peaceful people. They don't have any weapons. Um, 
but so that means they need to hire mercenaries, um, which is exactly straight out of Magnificent Seven, um, where the, some of the Mexican peasants go across the border to Texas to to gather up um, mercenaries. And so Richard Thomas's character Shad um, has to go do that. There's this thing in this movie which is called the Varda, which is their like code that they live by. And I guess the Varda is is just a, a way of not um, uh, killing people or not, you know, the Varda says blah, blah, blah. It's just kind of dialogue. Um, people or, you know, creatures in this are called forms, which I guess is okay. That's just sort of, I kind of don't like, uh, it's sidebar. I kind of don't enjoy uh, just random space jargon. Like, let's make up, you know, old sci-fi movies used to do that all the time. I don't really care for that. Um you know, it's better than uh, space people or something like that forms. But um, so this ship was is one of the main sets in the film. This is her name is Nell. She's a living ship um, completely designed by James Cameron, um, you know, uh, she speaks. She has a voice and she's actually one of the, you know, kind of main characters of the film and, and actually is a little more of a mentor to Shad than Zed is. Um, but we'll see when she takes off that her. Uh, her exterior is very interesting looking. And I think that uh, speaks a lot to James Cameron's sensibilities. Um, some of the interiors here, I love all these like blinking lights. It's very science fictional. Um, from the back, she sort of looks like a, uh, an electric razor. Uh, and the front, she looks like something else. Okay. So it's, it's an interesting looking ship anyway, as you can see. Um, aerodynamics don't really apply in space. Yeah, there's the electric shaver bit. Um, and you can kind of see, uh, on the front, it's not on the screen at this moment, but, um, it's a living female ship, and so it, for some reason, has what appear to be breasts. And I think that's very weird. Um, and, uh, but also kind of Cormany. You know, even though this is supposed to be like a family movie, there's definitely some sex in this. Not like outward, but that's kind of Corman's way. Um, just be a little bit sleazier. Um, these two guys, um, they're just stupid. <laughs> I mean, the characters are, I don't think as written, they're particularly bad or the actors are bad. Uh, this shot you're going to see a lot of because that for some reason is the only angle that those ships, the bad guy ships were shot. Um, and those, so it gets flipped sometimes, but it's always from the side kind of angled down or this front frontward facing thing. I think this shot looks really great. Um, they made the planet Akir with, you know, rock formations and everything, and then move the camera across it. Yeah, I think that is tops. Um, uh, and the sound effects you're hearing are those Alan Holtzman pew 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 kind of great sound effects. Um, and here we, we sort of establish that Shad, he's young, he doesn't, he's never harmed anyone, he doesn't want to uh, kill these guys, even though Nell's like, do it, you, you should do it. Um, but obviously, as he the further he goes along in his mission, he's going to have to um, do that. So they run away instead, um, and the two bad guys are are too dumb to, uh, or too afraid of Sador to um, to do anything about it. To so they just kind of keep quiet, um, much to their own downfall. Although they die from something completely different. And that's a shot you'll see again a lot is the bad guy ship turning, flipping over on its right side or left side, I guess. Um, this is actually really well edited, I think. Um, a lot of these space battles, um, a lot of the ones later, you can't really see what's going on, but um, I think these are really nicely done. And uh, again, James Horner's score is is truly great. It's 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 a score that I listen to just on its own a lot of the times, um, which is, I think, the the mark of a really great uh, score. Um, I'm still here. <laughs> um, so we've left the planet Akir. I don't understand that symbol. It's supposed to look like GZ or 52. I'm not entirely sure. This movie is a mystery to me. I saw this movie the first time 
uh maybe 2010 9 or 10 maybe i don't know uh no it would have had to be 10 or 11 um that's fun for a commentary um it came out on dvd from shout factory they're putting out a whole ton of roger corman uh films and and uh, in my capacity as a film reviewer and DVD reviewer for um, Battleship Pretension, I said, "Me, I'll take that." And so I got to watch it, and I was really like, "Wow, this is kind of, kind of great, and kind of weird, and kind of dumb, but I really enjoy it." I'd like anything with models in space. I think if it, if they're well done models, I'll, I'll overlook a lot of a lot of bad in the rest of the movie if if space stuff is cool. Um, the special effects in this were deemed so good that they were reused quite a few times. Uh, never let it be said that Corman didn't, you know, uh, get his money's worth. Um, some of these shots from later in the film are used in the beginning for literally no reason uh, for the film uh, uh, Forbidden World, which was kind of an alien ripoff. He did. He produced several of those alien ripoffs. And uh, the entirety of the uh special effects and the score in fact were reused for a later much dumber much worse um kids m- kid sci-fi movie called space raiders um so a lot of people maybe grew up with that movie i never have seen it in my life but maybe grew up with that movie and know the score from that um but no it was for battle beyond the stars um so they've reached their first destination which is hephaestus's station hephaestus is a guy who zed used to know and uh, is a is a builder of weapons and robots and things. Um, it's, it's sort of an interesting way for the film to start because it doesn't really pick up momentum right away. He gets off the planet and then you just see this kind of dead, um, really great looking um, special effect um, model of a space station, which is, uh, I think, sort of reminiscent of Alien and then certainly Aliens later on. Again, this James Cameron's work. Um uh, but I think it's kind of a slow way to start the movie. It, it, we're, what, 15 minutes into it, a little less. And uh, we just have shots, lingering shots of things, and, and not really all that many uh, characters. But um, Richard Thomas, I think, is really good. He's a good choice, I think. Um, TV actors are usually easier to get. Um, but it's also, he, he kind of has a Luke skywalker look, a Mark Hamill look. Um, which is what they wanted. Again, this was just trying to be. It wasn't. It wasn't like as as big a ripoff as something like Space or uh, Star Crash, my beloved Star Crash, which I'll probably do a, a commentary of at some point in my life. Um, which is just awful. But um, you know, there was there were no. They knew what they were doing. It's it's a young farm boy. Even his costume sort of looks like Luke's in. Um. Empire, weirdly, because he's not there yet. Um, so here we have uh, Nanalia, who is played by Darlan Flugel, who is an actress who's been in only a few things. Um, and she, I guess, was a, mostly a model up, up to this point. She's gorgeous. I would just like to say that great casting. And she's, re- I mean, she's really, I think she's a lot of fun in this movie. She's very doe-eyed and innocent and um, has basically lived her whole life around robots and doesn't really know how to interact with anybody else. Um, These things I think are cool. Um, The way they got around to doing robots, obviously they couldn't build full droids or, you know, big costumes like, like star Wars could do. So they just got guys who could do the robot (laughs) and and then put weird, you know, voice modulators on them, which I think is actually kind of great. This is, representative of some of the the sillier jokes in the film which i don't think work all that well um visual gags literally gagging him with thinking he's a robot um that's an easy effect that guy there with the half a body it's just they just build the thing around him and he's kind of like sticking through the back of the thing but it, i think it's really effective um yeah you can see in the background it's a guy who's supposed to be a robot and so he's just moving like he's doing the robot um uh <laughs> yeah darlan flugel one of the weirder names um but uh yeah she's real pretty very very frizzed out 80s hair but hey it's space i guess that that's sort of what happens in space um 
Yeah, I think at this point in the movie, when I was watching it the first time, I was kind of like, "All right, what a, what's this? What do we got here?" Um, that exact same hallway again. This is you know, fans of old Doctor Who will know that cheap sci-fi that you're trying to make look cool. You reuse what you have. Um, I'm not sure that this is a completely necessary thing. Uh, it, I'm sure people walking, people tiptoeing couldn't move faster than this thing. Um, it might be uh, vacuuming the floor at the same time. I have no idea. Um, and this is Hephaestus played by uh, Sam Jaffe, who was in uh, a lot of things. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to explain how many things he was in, but um, you've seen him before, if you've seen anything at all. What? No. Um He was in uh, Ben Hur and uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, so he's got some pedigree to him. Um, and this is one of the last things he did because he was very, very old. And the idea here is that Hephaestus, sort of like Sador, actually, um, his body has kind of deteriorated. But instead of like grafting flesh onto himself, he's kind of just made himself a, a robotic form. Um, since he's the robotics master. Hephaestus is, of course, a reference to the Greek god Hephaestus who made all the lightning, uh, excuse me, thunderbolts. I think they were called thunderbolts for Zeus. Um, yeah, Hephaestus. That was his one job, the god. Sidebar about Greek mythology. That's all he did. He just made thunderbolts for Zeus. I mean, I guess it's an important job, but, like, super boring. <laughs> Poke a guy in the chest, till he'll turn off. Um, it's very convenient that, uh, Nanalia is listening to what they're talking about, um, because otherwise she would have no idea and the plot would be a lot, uh, harder to move along. Uh, there, one story about this film is that, um, I like that guy with the glasses. I think he's maybe the best of the robot actor people. Um, uh, is that, uh, John Sale's original script is long. So they were trying to shoot the whole thing. Um, but you know, money's tight and, uh, Roger Corman is a shrewd, if anything, businessman. And there's a story where at one point to, toward the like last quarter of filming or something like that, uh, they were going over budget. And so he walked on set, uh, just everyone was quiet and he flipped through the script and was looking and just sort of haphazardly tore six pages out, fired five people and then said, all right, now we're back on schedule. Yikes. Um, clearly didn't fire any actors because that's your movie, but like, you know, stagehands. And most of Corman's crew, which is true forever, were people right out of film school or even people still in film school who were just like needing, you know, wanting hands on experience. And so that's why you get so many people who worked with Corman going on to being big people. You know, Scorsese worked with Corman and, um, uh, obviously John Carpenter and James Horner and just a, just, you know, young people he would get to do their first thing. And, uh, uh, most people who directed for Roger Corman only had to direct a couple of times. Um, there's another f fun saying or a uh, story where he would say, um, if you do a good job for me, you never have to work for me again, which is, <laughs> I think he knew he knows where his place in movie history is. And it has a lot to do with yelling at people. Um, yeah, she's. I, I wish she was in more stuff that I had seen, um, for obvious reasons, everyone, because I like her crimped hair. Yeah, so this is one of the first examples. I, I feel like you don't start out with such a slow-moving beginning. Um, part of the reason. Um, I think these scenes are well done and everything, but I think for pacing, stuff gets really overshadowed uh, later on and it's sort of rushed later on and they could have used more time then. But hey, you know, it's filmmaking. It's low budget filmmaking. They don't have all the, the time in the world or or the foresight maybe to be like, we, we don't need to spend so much time on these opening Shad and Analia scenes. Um, but they are sort of setting up that... Um, she has, uh, Hephaestus basically wanted him to stay and breed with his daughter. 
um, which I guess if he didn't have a planet to save, that'd probably be a good thing to do. But um, uh, she's, she's, that was a jump cut. Did you guys see that? Jump cut. Um, uh, she doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to do that. He can't stay. Um, and so he sort of convinces her to, to go with him because she can build stuff and she's, she's a tech person. She's never fought before either, but you know, she, she knows technology. All right. So she doesn't go, but then eventually she goes spoiler alert. Um, I feel like this gun that he grabs is sort of like similar to the Han Solo gun, but also looks a little like puffy, like sort of like the gun from, uh, the end of Videodrome when it's like part of his hand along with the new flash and all that. Um, I'm not sure what the point of windows in an interior of a ship are, but Hey, it looks cool. Yeah. There you can see a, a better image of, uh, Nell's breasts, not Nanalia's breasts, nails, the, the living ship. Um, she's going to bring her, her record collection with her and then be on her way. Um, everybody has their own very distinct ship in this film and, uh, hers is much like the station. It's very functional. It doesn't, uh, it's not all that pretty, but, um, it, it's, you know, mechanical. It looks like something that a robot builder would have. Um, and so then they're on their way and she has to go hang out for a while. The recruitment of all the the other seven, I guess, or there's actually more than seven, but as far as ships go, is very um, hit and miss, I think. Some of them you're like, okay, cool, and some of them I, I definitely think were silly. Um, also, how long is this taking him to do? Sometimes it seems like, I mean, they only have, what, a couple, like a week maybe until Sator comes back? You need to speed it up. Um, this is, uh, again, Sator's ship. It's called the Hammerhead. I think it looks really neat. Um, got a big hole in the middle of it for some reason. Um, but the idea of the ship is also that it can, uh, it's the stellar converter is the big weapon on it, which is of course, obviously like the Death Star, which can blow up a planet. The stellar converter can shoot and turn a planet into a sun, which is actually a terrible thing for the entirety of the universe. So you don't want that to happen. Um, uh, this is fun. This is just kind of some fun stuff with Sador where an ambassador that was sent to a planet to, uh, was vaporized and turned into dust. Um, Hey, we're not, we're not submitting to your ways. And so this, Oh, just threw a guy in his face. That's not fun at all. Um, so then that's when we learned about the stellar converter and what it can do. Cause obviously you need to show a force just like Alderaan gets destroyed in a new hope. You need to see how bad the Death Star is. You need to see how bad the Stellar Converter is so that we know to fear it. Um, that's screenwriting 101, everybody. Um, he's eating some sort of space hot pocket. Um, oh, you can see somebody's arm in the background. <laughs> that's fun. Um, like I said, I'm watching this on a Blu-ray. Okay. I think he needs to take that flag down. Uh, so this is a uh, space cowboy played by George Pappard, um, who obviously has a South Carolina Confederate flag on his ship. And the idea here is that he's from Earth. He's the Sparks, Nevada of this movie. Um, and he's a, he's like a truck driver, basically. There we go. George Pappard. Um, Pappard's a really fun actor who has been in a lot of obviously he was Hannibal in the A team for a number of years. This is sort of toward the end of his career. By all accounts, he was really fun to work with and kind of joking and kind of understood what kind of movie he was in. Um, interesting that he's wearing what appears to be insulation around his legs and has a jacket, but hey, you take what you can get. Um, uh, his first big role was in 1961's Breakfast at Tiffany's. He also was in a ton of war movies. Um, and he's, you know, he's a good laconic kind of, kind of guy. Um, he's m maybe got the most to do of any of the seven. Um, he has a lot of, you know, his role in the film is pretty good. So these are pirates who are trying to steal his, his payload and he's got no weapons and, uh, he's out of basically almost out of fuel. So 
he's gonna die. And uh, so Shad and Nell go, let's save this guy for some reason. I don't know if that's a reference to Star Wars. He says, they're coming from behind. No. Um, he doesn't want to shoot a guy in the back, but Nell did it anyway. Um, so he's mad about that. I would be too. He's also got no backbone at this point, which Nell is quick to point out. Nell's a fun character. She does not... She don't take no guff. Um, I don't know where she would take it, but I'm ching. Um... When you're in such a big ship like that, it's hard to make it look exciting when you when stuff's happening. So they use lights, kind of lights in his face. They don't really do a whole lot of dutching of the angle. Um, I, I want. I mean, okay, listen. If you uh, are some pirates and you're trying to steal some stuff, and then a ship comes up and starts blowing you up, I think you'd stop. You'd stop and run away. Um, don't just continue trying to steal the thing. I don't know. That's just more, maybe shoot the people down. I don't know. He's never taken a life before. What? Well, you know, I haven't either. I mean, except maybe bugs. Would I feel the same way? Maybe. Um, I think that's a, it's a silly joke to have the Confederate flag on the side of the ship, but you get the idea that he's from the South because he's a cowboy. Um, there are a lot of references to just Earth things in this, which is kind of, I mean, I think Papard uh, does it well, delivers it well, but I think part of it is a bit on the silly side. Um, I'm trying to think who the, the analog for Papard's character would be in um, Magnificent Seven. I guess there's not really one. Well, there's not really a direct correlation to any of them except for uh, Robert Vaughn's character, who we'll get to in, in a little bit. Um, Robert Vaughn was in The Magnificent Seven, and he's playing himself, basically. Um, so, uh, Cowboy, his name's just Cowboy, and he wants nothing to do with this until he sees the awesome power of the Stellar Converter, which is pretty awesome. Um, music here, again, terrific. Does anyone else get distracted by Richard Thomas's birthmark? Because I totes do. Oh, what a pretty way to die. Oh, it's sparkly. It's getting kind of warm. Cooler by the lake. And done. So nobody wants that to happen. Probably shouldn't have vaporized that guy. That's a great shot. The lighting on that is terrific. Look how horrible, how horrible Sador is. Will they ever win? They have such low odds of survival. And actually, to be fair, everyone in this movie has low odds of survival. It's not as though uh, they do a great job, which we'll get to in a little bit. But So he's got no um, um, weapons on his ship, but he he's carrying hand weapons. That's what we find out. Um, and so he's going to teach the people of Akir. He's going to deliver the weapons and teach them how to fight. Um, and he sort of agrees to do that. Yeah, Papard's really good. Papard's maybe my favorite part of this movie. Not everything he has to say is fun, but um, yeah. Fun continuity is watching his hat in every shot because it's completely on a different part of his head. Um, hey, again, they didn't have time for that. Yep, see, now it's on the back of his head. He knows what to do. He knows. He knows what to do. All right. Uh, so then we've moved back to Nanelli. Remember her? She's in this movie too. Um. She gets sort of attacked by this amorphous blob of color. Um, 
which I always think is going to lead to something more, but it doesn't. Um, you just something for Nanalia to do. She is the second. I mean, she's the leading lady, I guess, in this movie. Um, this is a cool ship. It looks like a a a frog or something with a big mouth, or like a one of those fish that engulf other things because that's kind of what this ship does um it uh takes over other ships and kind of if, if you're a doctor who fan it kind of pirate planets them um but this is kind of yeah see that's a cool shot it's gonna be a lot of this in this commentary too that's a cool shot um these are characters who I think should have more and probably do have more in a different cut of the film, but, um, or a different version of the script. I would love to read sales original script. Um, this is a really cool, you know, it definitely looks different. It's hot. It's smoky. Um, and here we're introduced to this guy. Um, his name's Cayman. Uh, and he's got a ship full of kind of ragtag mercenary people. There's, uh, buff dude who literally does nothing in this movie uh, and then there's Kelvin which are the two bald little guys over there um, Kelvin are uh, temperature like they communicate via temperature they can heat up and cool down depending on mood and to convey different things um, which is a strange idea that pays off the one and only time that it does um, Cayman is a character who is is basically out for himself. He wants n nothing. Um, he is basically just trading in things for food or trying to turn things into food. And the only reason he gets convinced to join is because he's the last of his species and his planet was destroyed by Sador. So he's out for revenge, um, which is a good motive. Again, I wish this character was in it more because um, he's interesting. Uh and this is maybe one of his only big scenes. He's got maybe th three big scenes, if that. Um, but this proves that Nanalia is also smart because she can talk them into the helping. Um, the makeup effects on Cayman are pretty good. I'm not going to say they're great, but um, they're pretty good. He's got ear holes, like all lizards do. Um, that's tattooed guy's one job is to cut her down there's probably a, a scene that got cut where he fights people but we don't get to see it alright so this, this ship has joined another really cool ship design and unlike I guess sort of Star Warsy, but these ships are very bumpy all of them they're kind of like they've got stuff on them there's nothing sleek they're not mass produced i don't think they're kind of just built these are cool people um or a cool entity um it, john sales probably had just a ton of fun coming up with the different aliens and the different people to help because again they come from all over they're you know a ragtag group of um mercenaries uh and so this this ship this is actually the ship that gets reused in uh uh, Forbidden World as the good guy ship for the first seven minutes of the film and then you never see it again um, and so yeah uh, Shad gets taken aboard the ship and these are these are Nestor Nestor is a a hive minded kind of omnipotent sort of thing it's it's a being and these are just five facets of uh, of Nestor um, it's a really interesting idea. So there's more of Nestor elsewhere, but you know, Nestor wants to experience new things. It all it wants to um, see adventure. It wants to do things like that, and so it sends parts of itself out to experience things, so that the rest of Nestor can understand. It's kind of a super cool idea, and also a really easy ship design uh, on the interior. Just give me a TARDIS console and a white room. No black curtains involved. The rubbery shakiness of that gun is not apparent at all. Uh, their third eye, clearly, clearly a part of their head and not uh, painted on. 
Um, need to be on a turntable. Yeah, I mean, they did what they could. This is um, that the main Nestor is Earl Bowen, who plays Dr. Silverman in, uh, or Silber, Silberman, I don't remember, in the Terminator movies. Um, you've seen him before. He's also a very prominent boy, voice actor. Um, this is 1980, so it was even before the first Terminator. Um, but hey, maybe John James Cameron met him on this, and that's why he cast him in the Terminator. Who can say? Um, but yeah, you can clearly see that's like a, a sock over their head and, um, they were given like a brain thing, which, you know, again, it's a super low budge. Most of the budget was spent on, uh, the special effects, which it should have. Please offer people drinks when you go aboard ships. I would just like to say that I would really hate wearing the uh, the outfit that Shad is wearing because uh, that I any kind of turtleneck and there's a snap involved. No, thank you. To quote uh, Mitch Hedberg, it's like you're being strangled by a really weak guy. Um, one of these other Nestor is a guy that I met one time, which I'll talk about later on. All right. So this is a really rough scene, I think. Um, so it's these two stupid bad guys again. Uh, and they're watching the Akir. They're basically the patrol. And we see that uh, um, this Shad's sister, I believe, uh, is performing a marriage ceremony. Um, which is great for them on this planet. But they're still trying to make it work and, and all of that. However, they decide to go be horrible, horrible people. Uh, monsters, basically. Um, and, uh, yeah, is that, I, is, is it Julia Duffy? Is that that woman's name? Or Karen Duffy? It's one of the Duffies. Anyway, she was in Newhart. That's why I know who she is. Um, I could look this up, but I'm not going to. Um, so they just completely abduct her and were led to believe they do awful things to her, which is completely not nice. <laughs> also... Uh, yeah, so we'll get to that further on, but that feels like a cutaway that doesn't need to be there. We just need to see that bad things are happening. This is a cool planet. Um, obviously desolate, and if it's a desolate planet with thunderstorms, you know it's bad. Yeah, really great model shots here. And that's, like, what I absolutely love about science fiction is just, let's make something look otherworldly. Let's let's explore even if we don't have enough money to do so. I think that's fun. And I'm happy that uh, Roger Corman decided to do this. He didn't ever really do a Star Wars-type movie. Obviously, they did Space Raiders, um but they did a lot of alien ripoffs because I think those are probably easier to do because you don't need all that many ships. You just need, you know, a, a ship and then a monster. And monsters are easy to make and also look terrible most of the time. Um, very reminiscent of Alien This. Let me get my gun out. I would hate to see the kind of spiders that would leave cobwebs of that nature on this planet. And then uh, Shad finds that this used to be like a bustling casino full of bad guys, kind of Moss eisley -ish, but it's it's completely not anymore. Um, and so there's some really cool shots here where, or just moments where the old, uh, you know, you can see the disused uh, neon sign um, dial a drug. Yeah, this was not a fun place to be. Um, he'll take some of those drugs. Is 
Does he do it? I forget if he does. No, he doesn't. He decides better. Uh, this is sort of fun too. This is like dial a date. So uh, sort of like a like one of those booth things. Um, I've never been to a sex shop, so I have no idea. Ooh, hey, she's kind of nice and 80s looking. How about her? Gets a little hot around the collar there, huh? I bet she's looking real fine. <laughs> nope, she's dead. Dead 80s chick. Well, she's not dead, she's a robot, but... Gross. Gross nonetheless. Hand and a gun, hand and a gun. And there we have Mr. Robert Vaughn, the man from Uncle himself, uh, who played Lee. I think that was his character in uh, Magnificent Seven, who was the gambler who was running from... He basically, he had won so much from people uh, and and caught so many people because he was a bounty hunter as well that uh, he couldn't go anywhere because there were bounties on his head. So that's exactly the storyline with this guy. He has obtained all of this wealth, but he can't go anywhere to spend it. And he always has to kind of live with the... Um, one eye open and kind of like sit with his back to the door, that type of guy, because anybody would want to catch him and and kill him because he's he's got such a huge bounty on his head and he's got all that gold and jewelry and stuff sitting there. Um, Vaughn is a is an actor I really like. Um, he doesn't have a whole lot to do in this movie, unfortunately. They try to give him something to do, but uh. I'm not entirely sure that he's super excited to be in a movie like this. Um, he seems very flat. And maybe that's just a character choice he's making. His character in Magnificent Seven certainly is not that. He's very jumpy and uh, um, worried about most things. Um, but uh, he, I like his sort of space age 70s garb. Um, this little area, and actually the music that plays in here, um, which is kind of like this movie's version of the Cantina Band song, as I feel very reminiscent to the first episode of Battlestar Galactica, not the new one, but the old um, Saga of Star World, Battlestar Galactica, where they go to that weird casino-y thing with, uh, that Ray Meland is hosting. That show is weird. I might do an episode about that at some point. Um... Pretty good lighting for this. Um, and I like I like that the only reason the only what he has to offer is great, but what he wants in return is simple, which is he just wants to be able to sleep calmly and have a home cooked meal because he's just been sitting here among death and wealth that he can do nothing with for such a long time, and I think that's really. A nice character thing for him. Uh, Gelt is this character's name. Um, and in the opening credits, uh, Robert Vaughn is the second build, but re and and George Papard gets the end. But it really should be the other way, I think. And I think in some listings it is. Uh, fun mojito he's drinking, or whatever the hell that is right there. Uh, and so then we get, uh, I think, our last uh, person to join the group, which is a little annoying <laughs> flittery ship, which doesn't seem to have much in the way of uh, weaponry. And we find out that it's piloted by somebody named Saint X-Men of the Valkyrie, who is played by Sybil Danning. Um, you, it's pretty, but she's an Austrian actress. I think, uh, it's pretty clear right away, uh, why she was cast in this movie once you see her. Um, uh, but she sort of is like the, um, the Tashir Mufune character from, um, Seven Samurai who she doesn't really have, you know, she's young, she's impetuous. She doesn't, she's not trained or anything like that, but she's eager for a fight. And I guess that's sort of what Horse Buckholtz's character in um, Magnificent Seven is, although Horse Buckholtz and uh, 
uh, Richard Thomas's characters are sort of similar to. So it's not a direct, but I think along with Gelt being the Robert Vaughn character directly, I think St. X-Men is as close as we have to uh, an analog to another character from the, the film. Yeah. Okay. Hey, there's Sybil Danning. She's certainly got some eye makeup going on and some sort of weird helmet, but uh, why would they have cast her in this movie? I wonder. And, um, Oh, Hey, maybe that's why. Holy, holy heavens. Uh, yeah, she was, she's known for being a very buxom woman. Uh, and they certainly don't shy away from that in this film. Um, uh, she was in, um, people who enjoy crappy horror movies. She was in a couple years after this, uh, the howling Two, your sister is a werewolf, uh, which is given the alternate title Sturba werewolf bitch. Um, and guess who she played that one. Um, so this is interesting cause, uh, Shad is like, nah, we don't want you. We don't need you. We have no, no use for you, but she t tags along anyway. Um, and her whole deal is that she, she's sort of like a Klingon or a Suntar and she wants to fight and thinks killing is, it's just a part of her nature, but, um, and now that this is sort of them all coming back together, here we are almost 50 minutes into the film and everybody's finally, uh, been recruited. It's, f it's fun to note that the movie is only an hour 42 and yet, uh, here we are less than an hour left and, uh, and they haven't even really gotten together yet, but Hey, again, we'll get to some of where I think the movie doesn't do great. And I, I'm making fun of it the whole time, but I actually think this is, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's an enjoyable kind of, um, you know, light sci-fi movie. It's not as hard hitting, but it's in the vein of star Wars. Um, it's a lot more tongue in cheek than star Wars. It's a lot more kind of body in some places, obviously with the same X-Men's character. And there'll be some interesting discussions about sex later on. Uh, there's Gelt ship. Gelt ship is super neat. It's the closest to being sleek because he is a professional. He's a professional mercenary. He's a professional bounty hunter. He's a professional killer. Um, uh, I do not think his ship, the interior there looks particularly comfortable because it looks like he's laying down the whole time. Same with the same X-Men's character, but, um, uh, that's a great exchange. <laughs> Papard's like, Hey, where are you from friend? I'm from earth. And then Vaughn just says, I was born in space. Not a sense of humor, that guy. Um, and he chooses to fly behind because he doesn't want anybody behind him. Um, and then the ship has come back. Hey, cool. Now we're all together. It's like a fleet. Is it a trap? No, not yet. How proud of herself she is. Uh, I love a lot of aliens in movies who can't close their mouths because they just can't. The makeup doesn't work that way. How uncomfortable that must be. Plus with the head, the head thing. Actually, on second look, I think Robert Vaughn's is actually more comfortable. They let St. X-Men come along. Uh, that's a, it's an, the one thing that I think that Cameron and the team did a, a good job of is making the interiors of the ship all look different and the way that you fly the ship look different. So obviously you see there, Cowboy's got the, the kind of overhead, it looks like a periscope, but it's, it's the way you control his ship. Um, obviously the Nestor ship is weird and, uh, um, Gelt's got the two kind of joystick things and, um, the, uh, Cayman ship is just a big kind of freighter ship. So everybody kind of has their own way of controlling things. Nobody else's ship is alive. I'll tell you that much. It also never explains why Nell is a living ship. Why is she alive? Why does she have a consciousness? It doesn't really matter, but they don't ever explain it. Uh, and then you can see the relative sizes of all the ships. And there it's just an immobile, that guy ship. Um,
I think this guy's performance is very strange. It's like he couldn't talk through the, the teeth, and so he's kind of talking like this the whole time. I don't know what to do. Are they like pig people? I'm not entirely sure. They're just deformed in some fashion. Yep, there's that same shot again. Is he acting or is he just looking at stuff? So, okay, so this... it I guess we're sort of uh, led to believe that they were doing horrible, violent, possibly sexually aggressive things against uh, Shad's sister. I'm almost positive that he never knows that this happened to her and never thinks to ask where she is. That may have been a scene that was cut, um, but she holds them up long enough for Gelt to destroy them. It's a sad ending for that character who was not in the movie very much and the implications are very dark this isn't all fun and games you guys this is bad stuff that happens but can you imagine if something like star wars had like <laughs> references to rape or something like that jesus oh corman uh yep so you can see the floor um, and this is a, a direct analog to the scene, same scene in um, Magnificent Seven, where they all show up, and uh, and then Horse Bocolta's character yells at the 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 town for for hiding, basically, which is what everyone, all the Akira have done. They've they're hiding from the the approaching people because they're afraid of everything, and they should have given a warm welcome. Um, this was the second of those scenes that I said came and had that was big. Did you see him talk? That's about why it's big. Um, this is one of the only shots, scenes in the whole movie where they're all physically in the same space, all the actors. Um, most of Robert Vaughn's stuff is by himself in a ship or with, a, you know, maybe one or two other actors. But this is the one time everybody's all in the same physical space, which I think is cool. good thing she brought her cds with her because that was very important so now we get to s actually have a planning session how uh, uh how bored robert vaughn looked in that last shot maybe he's distraught who can say remember this shot this was earlier in the film So they're talking about the stellar converter and how almost impossible it is to fight. Um, but they can do it. They'll figure it out. I should be somewhere else. I don't want to be here. Uh, so this planet can apparently, another really cool idea from uh, uh, John Sales, can shift, seismically shift the... Uh, the plate tectonic, uh, the plates, excuse me, the plates of the, the planet and create craters and mountains and things like that. So they're creating a bunch of trenches to be able to fight in and kind of make it harder for uh, any ground troops to, because basically Sador does not want to destroy this planet. He wants to overtake it and to do that, he has to stop all the people. And so if they're harder to fight, uh, can't shoot them outright. They're not just standing there ready to be shot they have to send in the ground transport. So that's what they're hoping happens with this, is that they're, and then they're creating trenches for their forces to hide in. Um, this is kind of a neat shot, all these shots of, of the ground collapsing. Um, pretty easy shot, you just build up a ground that has, parts of it is, is stuck, and then the rest of it you can kind of pull down, and then that causes the dirt to fall. Uh, George Papard's character really takes to this woman, who is uh, a character who is in the opening scene, but I don't know her name. Um, this is a fun, also stupid thing, which is that he has scotch and soda 
and ice on his belt. Why are you lingering on that shot, Jimmy? I wonder. Uh, and so this is uh, St. X-Men talking to um, Nanalia about sex and how great it is. And uh, how much she wants to bone Shad, but won't because of girlfriendliness. But she really thinks she ought to go and give it a shot. And I agree. Um, this movie definitely spends a lot more time with the bad guys than The Magnificent Seven or The Seven Samurai do. Both of those movies are much longer than this. However, um, in uh, The Magnificent Seven, uh, Eli Wallach is the bad guy. He is in the opening scene and then literally doesn't come back again until almost the end. Um, maybe a little less than almost the end. but um, And in Seven Samurai, I mean, that is almost a four-hour long movie, but I don't think you ever see the bad guys again until they start coming back and there's the big battle. But this is this movie has spent quite a lot of time with John Saxon's character. Um, we've already seen the stellar converter, and uh, and he's sort of they actually get, make him a character, which I actually I kind of enjoy. We do spend a lot of time in Star Wars with Grand Moff Tarkin and and Lord Vader. Granted, they have Princess Leia aboard their ship, and then the bad guys or the good guys come and stow away aboard the ship, but um, or the Death Star, I guess. Um, but we do spend a lot of time with Saxon in this, uh, and there's nobody on his ship. Uh, this is a, this is a cute scene. This is them talking. She's asking him how, how sex happens, procreation. And he's like, whoa, hey now. Uh, <laughs> there's a fun thing in this where they talk about, um, is it just is it just the two sexes? Because there are some have three or four, and he's like, no, 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 that's just just man and woman. Uh, there's no. I would like to point out that there is no judgment against same sex things in this. She just asked how procreation works. Right, I think we can all agree that regardless of your views on same sex unions, procreation still requires both sexes. Right? Okay, or test tubes, I guess. Um, this is fun. Uh, so they're making out and, and, uh, and then she makes that fun. She's like, I think it's your torque bar. She's still a mechanic. It's fun to see Richard Thomas kind of flustered in this way. Um, it's a funnier scene than a lot of the movie and like actually funny. Um, I don't think it's, it's not as, I mean, it's, I mean, all right, hitting your head, but it's a, it's not quite as dumb as some of the other comedy scenes. Uh, this is hilarious to me. They are sitting around Kelvin like a campfire because they're very warm. Uh, Cayman has a knife for a hand. I don't know if you guys knew that. I, I like that uh, they gave uh, St. X-Men a separate costume a costume that surely she fell out of a three or four times because it's just strips of vinyl um and this is something in the trailer if you guys have seen the trailer um where uh cowboy gives kelvin a hot dog and he gives it yeah that's cool see they're all tasting it it's part of their thing He says there's no dog in this. That's fun. That's fun stuff. Um, this is the light part of the film. I would also, once they show them again, I, and they definitely will in the big battle. A lot of the Akira are very late 70s, early 80s looking dudes with kind of long curly hair and mustaches. Um, now, this is interesting. They sort of fold in a, a thing that happens in Magnificent Seven. Uh, to Charles Bronson's character where he kind of like um, meets the kids because uh, he plays a character in that movie called Bernardo O'Reilly who is a half Mexican half Irishman um, and the Mexican peasants kind of come over and talk to him about that because they're sort of like wow you're a Mexican blah, blah, blah. and he, he sort of has been hiding that side of him for a while and he kind of has a bond with those kids they kind of fold that a little bit on to Gelt maybe just to give him something to do but um 
it's sort of a weird scene. The kids come over and they're like, are you a bad man? And he's like, yes, of course. And it's, he's very heavy handed about it. I don't think Vaughn does a bad job. I think it's kind of a weirdly written scene. Um, another TARDIS console. Bad things happen. Who is this guy? I mean, he's just hanging out with, with Cayman, but he's just like, I have a spear and tattoos and stuff. Good job. Just poke him in the ass. And he's out. Cowboy's done. He doesn't. He's he only joined to to help, and he's he's not gonna stick around too much longer. <laughs> and Gelt's just going. I guess. Uh, guess it's time. It's time for me to join my ship again. I really like this scene between cowboy and this woman it would just be great if i knew who this woman was if they spent any time kind of establishing her as a character other than just having her stand next to cowboy but the odds are hopeless we could really use a guy like you this is the han solo scene but he can't take off that's that's the real thing here is that he can't take off because of the, the blockade so it's like all right i guess uh i guess it's time to have some scotch She says, you forgot the ice and soda. And he goes, no, I didn't. I think those are monkey skulls on his lapel, on Sador's lapel. Good. I think she was spending too much time outside of her ship. I'm glad they put her back in it. I don't know if that's supposed to be a reference to Gorbachev, that weird, like, kind of scar thing on his face, but um, let's say that it is. That was a very Star Destroyer reshot. So, I guess what they're trying to do is disable the Stellar Converter to draw the ground forces, because they have no, basically, no weapons on. I hate that shot of the guy with the, the dome helmet because we've already established what the inside of those ships look like and it's not that uh, and he looks like he's just playing Simon or like a keyboard or something I hate it that guy, jeepers creepers look like you're flying a ship for god's sake she's doing a better job and she's just laying on her back yeah Gelton Shad. Um, exact same shot again. Take a drink every time you see that shot. And this is where this really starts becoming repeated shots, the movie. Um, not quite at this point yet, but later on. Um, and I think what my problem, I guess, with the, the end of this movie is or starting to be the end of this movie. Because up to this point, it's been fun. There's some dumb stuff in it, sure, but it's a lot of fun. There's some great special effects and some interesting characters. Um, but we start losing people quickly, and we and I feel like they don't get a whole lot of time to, to shine. Um, Cayman, for example, I've said before, like he's an, a character who has a vendetta against, against Sador. So obviously he wants to do something important he wants to be able to to take this guy out or at least stop him in some way and uh he doesn't do a whole lot um great shot of just a guy breathing that was fun um this is still pretty cool this establishes that the bad guy lasers are green and the good guy lasers are red or kind of yellowy which is exactly what star wars did this I think is super cool. It's fun. It's a it's a it's a it's a fun assault. The exact same shot as before. With Gelt. Um, we need some more time with Cayman, and we need some more time with Gelt. I think is is the main my main issue. 
we could use some more time with everybody to be fair but um there's just there literally isn't time in the movie for that um this is a movie that could be two hours and 15 minutes and i don't think it would be bad um And you start here with all these, the weird frog ships or whatever those the bad guy ships look like. I think they look kind of like frogs. Um, you can't really see anything. You can't really tell what's going on. The exact same shot again, only with laser fire added. And this, it does establish though that Gelt is good at his job. He's an excellent pilot and he's an excellent fighter. He's just not giving us anything though. I feel like... As much as I like Robert Vaughn in general, I think he doesn't, he didn't really care for this movie. Or maybe he did. Maybe he was doing what he thought he was just trying to be the cold calculated guy, but there's not much in his facial features to, to denote that he's doing anything. Uh-oh. So now we got some uh, uh, heat seekers or, uh, you know, thermal bombs or whatever the hell. Uh, all of these things have names. I don't uh, care to learn those type of things, unless it's Star Wars. I know a proton torpedo. So this, how is this going to work? Wow, that's an amazing thing to have happen. They lure the sh the uh, the heat seeker to blow out one of the thrusters. But how did Nell move away so fast? And this is a this is a a scene that's completely built in cuts, because obviously the individual shots of faces don't do a whole lot. They don't tell you much, but you mix it with the music, you mix it with the sound effects, you mix it with this kind of cool thing. Um, and and I think it does work. So his his ship got shot. So now they just add smoke. He's gonna have to. He's gonna have to crash land. Which is a bad bad move for or bad uh, thing to have happen to the good guys because he was easily the best fighter among them. Part of the other thing that I don't care for, speaking of, of people getting dispatched too quickly, is that Shad kind of has like a wrap up thing to say about everybody. And it just it feels very hokey to me, a little a little disingenuous. Um we'll get to that a little bit once we get to it. Now we have the gr the ground battle. And Cowboy's leading all of these super 70s looking dudes um, with their feathered hair and whatnot. Um, and these were probably just, you know, extras, maybe even just crew members. Like, they just needed guys. Um, and now they're going to start the ground battle. And I like that we have Hannibal with the, with the cigarette again. That's not a cigar, but, it, you know, he's leading stuff. And this is a pretty fun scene, I think. Or sequence. We don't actually get to see the montage of them learning how to do any of this stuff, which I think is another thing that Magnificent Seven uh, and the Seven Samurai do great. <laughs> Obviously, those movies are much better than this movie, but there are whole scenes where they're trying to teach the peasants how to use their uh, their newfound weapons and 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 the town basically as a a weapon. Bad guys have green blood. Everyone knows this. Not the guy in the dress. Someone hired Biker Santa Claus to lead the bad guy battalion. Smoky and Shadows. That's the key to a cavernous sci-fi thing. So this is a sonic... Oh my god, now that's like gory. That's blood literally spewing out of people's ears this is a it's a sonic tank um blowing people's heads up with sound great music cues here from horner um this woman apparently has no problem not covering her ears and the coward gets shot. That's what happens, kids. Don't be a coward or you'll get shot. Yeah, man. It's like actual blood in this movie. 
feathered haired people their ears exploding this is kind of a cool you know few shots of just like oh man we're getting boned what in the world is warrior guy doing So Nestor 1 explains that Kelvin is volunteering because they have no ears. So they're going to try to destroy the sonic tank. They have something to do. They don't speak, but they have something to do. They're not just a campfire, ladies and gentlemen. So they jump in front of the tank and flame on or whatever when they blow it up. Which is, that's a pretty smart idea. I think Kelvin is is a good functional character question mark more of like a device but burn those guys to death i guess they yeah and then they faint these two guys maybe one's a girl i have no idea uh not the best actors they were small enough and willing to be in makeup but i love that guy there's there's my friend the curly haired mustachioed fellow what yep you helped for sure man biker santa claus not having a good day all right let's let's go for it now they don't have their secret weapon we've taken them by surprise now they're running away what they still have armor on i wonder if oh hey there's the one thing he does he spears two guys there's no way that spear went through two people uh and so here's the heroic end of zed who is blind i would like to remind everyone as if you didn't notice and he's trying to there, he gets a he gets a few hits in. He's a warrior still, the one warrior among the Akira. And then boom, the death of Zed. Poor guy. All right, you're milking a little bit, man. Uh that's kind of neat. Nell can uh, sense when Zed has died. Um. I like the star field out there. The the clearly immobile, only five feet out from the screen star field. Um, and he's literally just sitting in a chair. Like, there's nothing below. It's just a weird chair that he's sitting on. It must have been weird for Richard Thomas to basically have most of his scenes talking to a ship. God, that guy with the curly hair is like just trying to force himself to be in all these shots. Was he somehow related to Roger Corman? I have no idea. Uh, so what they don't explain right here is exactly where, what Sador is doing. Did he pull back? Um, Sin X-Men's all excited about having fought and killed people. Everything was great. War isn't good, you crazy woman, he seems to say. Uh, what do you mean? Do you want to look at my boobs some more? Uh, Sybil Denning was the bad bad person in uh, the uh, Hercules movie, um, which was directed by Luigi Cozzi, who also directed Star Crash. Um, she played, I mean, it was like a space Hercules, sort of. Um, Lou Ferrigno was Hercules, but she was the bad witch in it. Um, and it's hilarious. It was made, I think, just a year or two after this. Um, yeah, it makes me laugh. Check that one out if you get a chance. That guy, yep. Oh boy, oh boy, he landed right on some, some cherry compote. Maybe some ragu. I'm not entirely sure what that substance is, but yeah, you can you can clearly see that Gelt's not long for this world. Wonder, I mean, with movies like this, and you have like names in it, even people who are not like giant, giant stars, but you know, stars, 
most of the time you can only get them for a few days. So I feel like Robert Vaughn came in for like three or four days, maybe five, and and did all of his scenes. Um, Richard Thomas talks about how he was perfectly pleasant. It was it was nice to work with him, but he was very quiet on the set. He would read a lot. He wasn't chummy with everybody. Um, and this was sort of you know, Robert Vaughn has since been in every movie uh, or every TV show uh, ever. It seems like, but. This was sort of in the in the middle years when he was mostly just on Columbo a bunch, I think. Um, they do not explain how this happened, but one of Nestor has been captured by uh, Sador, and this is sort of a um, yeah, there he is. Uh, and that's the the guy on the right, the, the part of Nestor that's aboard the ship, is uh, a man named John Gowans, who I met and was in a, sh a film that we made one time, which you will never see because it's terrible. Not him, me, and us making it didn't do a good job. Um, I didn't know that until after I'd worked with him, and then I saw this movie and I was like, is that, wow, that's, that's the guy that I know. Anyway, fun <laughs> name-dropping story. Um... But they've allowed for a Nestor to be taken so that they can graft an arm onto the gross, craggy, uh, disgusting arm of Sador. And so you kind of get to see that that's what he does. Um, is it a, I think that's like a sword scar. Not like from a sword, but it's like shaped like a sword. He conducts this doctor. He can conduct things with his pointing. A little dumb, but. And I like that they just were like, all right, well, let's kill that part of ourselves. He just dies immediately. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually a pretty genius idea that the Nestors have, um, which is, which we'll see in a moment, when they start, they graft on the arm, uh, they can still control the arm because they are Nestor and they have a, um, a hive mentality. And so they try to use it, try to use the arm to kill Sador or make Sador's arm kill himself. It's a gene, it's really kind of a cool idea. And here we can kind of see that Sador's look is a little like space age biker samurai a little bit maybe a reference to seven samurai um haha -ha joke we'll have to make some new gloves Yep. Genius. Love it. They should have waited a little bit longer for him to be like a little bit more uh, away from people. But they tried. The key is that they tried. <laughs> Boy, very upset. I feel like there was a longer scene that we just didn't realize. I don't know when he became George C. Scott all of a sudden. Uh, Shad. We also learned that the... Uh, Nestor do not need all five of them to pilot the ship. One is always extra as a spare. And here we go, approaching the third act, and um, Nanalia gets to be on board Nell. Um, and so it sort of gets to be like a three a three sided scene um, while they fight the end with Nell along with her. Um, I just realized there's sort of a, like a weird uh, 
Aryan nation thing going on with these two because they're both blonde eyed, blonde eyed and blue haired. Nope, blonde hair and blue eyed. So they're gonna make gorgeous, multi special babies. That's something that we can talk about once we actually do Star Wars. It's a we're gonna do all the Star Wars movies. That's a little teaser for all of you. Um, are people from other planets different species, or are they all humans still? I guess they're probably all humans. Yeah. There, I've answered my own question. No need to listen to those commentaries. Just kidding. It'll be fun. Time to make out. Everyone's dying. Let's make out. Cauterizing the wound. I like this doctor guy. I don't know who it is. Actor. There's a lot of these actors who were just like guys that they hired. They were nobodies. Um, so now he's real angry. And so no more Mr. Nice Guy. They're just going to destroy everything. There's that shot we've seen before. I f Ugh, gross. It's the same shot they've just pushed in. What is He's typing. He's doing his taxes while they're firing. I think that's so bad. All right, here we go. Now we're making out. It's time to fight. Hey, remember Cayman? He's in this movie, too. Spend more time with Cayman. God damn it. I would love to see... Apparently there was a comic book version of this that came out, maybe. Um, I would like to read that, or I would like to see... Uh, I would like to read the original screenplay. Just to see how different it is. Uh, same shots. Repeated shots. Very low budgety thing to do. I also like that Sador's, he's like, I'm really mad now. Let's just send more fighters. <laughs> we don't need anything more. That exact same shot again. And I feel like that's the detriment is that by tearing out all the different pieces, all the different pages from the script, you are left having to construct your finale via shots you've already gotten. Um, you see there's not a whole lot of dialogue going on through here. It's just shots of stuff, which I think is sort of a detriment to the film. Um, because these are characters that we think are interesting. They're enjoyable. They're, or could be more interesting. But you got yourself some good space battles. Nothing wrong with a good space battle. Um, Nestor sacrifices himself. Itself? I'm not entirely sure how, what the the plural, I guess, of them are. Um, that shot was used quite a lot in other things. In there was there's also a funny thing where a lot of Corman trailers that came out after this, if they were set in space or whatever, like the Galaxy of Terror trailer, would just have shots from this movie in the trailer, even though they do not appear in the film. Because it's like, literally, we have these shots, they look great, let's use them again. Any old time we can. Alright, stellar converter time. We know what that's going to be. Screenwriting 101. Uh, and I like the Cowboys, like I said earlier, has got maybe the best arc of anybody in the film. Uh, he kisses this random woman <laughs> who he's been spending time with. Uh, and he knows that it he's not gonna he's not gonna make it, but he's gonna go help anyway. She looked vaguely sexually gratified by that last moment. I'm sure that was a d directorial thing. Look more like you're having sex while you're doing this. But the the irony, I guess, the kind of like uh, poetic justice here is that even though. Saint X Men did not want, or uh, Shad did not want Saint X Men to join. She ends up being the one who, uh, who allows them to win by destroying the Stellar Converter. Um, by kamikazeing. Spoiler alert. Weird scream. She sends most of her ship 
into the thing and destroys the stellar converter and then she's just kind of a sitting duck does dude on the left have a camera around his i don't know uh this shot i think is dumb because it doesn't look very good at all And so here again, we have a character who's going to die, and then Shad says a thing that she says. It's like her little mantra. Live fast, fight well, die well, or whatever it is. Um, and earlier when uh, Gelt died, he was like, have a, a meal prepared and buried with him. It's the only thing he wanted. Like, it's just, a, it's very hokey, I think, referring to all those different things in succession. And that's the other thing. It's it's rapid succession. Um, everybody just dies so fast. Hey, remember Cayman again? What has he been doing this whole time? And now he finally gets to talk to Sador. Him in his weird tarp of a shirt that he's wearing. And he goes... Uh, I think he, his, his his creature name is the Lazuli, I believe. And he's like, I thought I destroyed all of you years ago. And that was literally just to give the character any and all kind of uh, uh, importance or kind of a moment. Uh, he does do a good job, it needs to be said. Uh, he doesn't fight much in this movie, but he does f have a uh, an impact. Oh, there's Cowboy. And they they all kind of like say who they are before they kill themselves. I am Saint Xman of Val, the Valkyrie. I am Cayman, the last of the Lazuli. I am this is Space Cowboy from the planet Earth. It's like all right, we get it. That's the other thing that I think is super hokey. It's like just do it. Don't announce yourself. Apparently, he does have weapons. They're just laser beams, but he still has them. Is it? I think it's funny that it looks like a CB radio because <laughs> he's a trucker. I am most displeased. Or maybe it's an electric shaver. That's what it is. It's a it's a mixture. Dead. Dead times. It's literally just shots of people. I I feel like you you really have to buy into this movie by the end, or you just get annoyed by it. Um, when I do both, I, this is like uh, I've seen this movie quite a few times. Because, like I said, despite all my making fun of it, I do think it's fun and it makes me feel like a kid. And when I was a kid, I didn't care about stupid crap like that. Um, how his ship caught fire back there, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but he's now careening to his death. Uh, and it should be stated that in the Seven Samurai, basically everybody dies. And in Magnificent Seven, basically everybody dies. So, you know, all the mercenaries. So, it's it, there, it's not without precedent to have all these people die. I just wish that there was more time with all of them. And actually in Magnificent Seven, there's not... Um, there are characters who die and you're like, he didn't really need to die other than just the script calls for him to die. Like James Coburn's character, who is supposed to be the greatest. Uh, all right. You can go ahead and howl there as he does his thing. Uh, Cayman gets to blow shit up. Um, um, but James Coburn's character is, is has the best aim in the world or something like that, and he dies for literally no reason at all. Spoilers for Magnificent Seven. He literally just crashes... It came and just goes boom. Explodes underneath. And that's it. Everybody's done. Nell is the only ship left.
You can't do it. Don't ever tell me the odds. These are references to Star Wars. That was a shot of the Nestor ship. Did you see that? It was the only shot they had, so they had to do it for two seconds. Uh, Got to blow up all these. This is like a video game now, because he basically just has to blow up things that are shooting at you. Um, like happens in video games. You're going to miss some, and you're going to take some damage, like right now. Because, um, you know what? Nobody escapes. In this movie, Every, pretty much everybody dies. So many people die, even Nell, which is sad. Now she loses her memory and thinks that, um, thinks that uh, Zed is is the one flying the ship because that was her original owner. Um, I suppose this was sort of a an idea to kind of like get the droid in the film without actually having to build a droid, which is just to make. I mean, she's much sassier. And less kind of dopey than um, C-3PO, but like it's a ship and she does talk. And so you kind of get that um, character type of thing out of the way. And it is kind of a neat idea to have the ship be a character. I mean, because the Magn uh, Magnificent Seven, the Ma Millennium Falcon basically is a character, certainly. Even though it doesn't speak, but it's such an iconic figure, such a, uh, an important part of those movies. That guy just looks haughty all the time. The droopy-eyed guy. What I want to know is, had nobody ever fought them like this? Because it's great. I mean, it makes a good adventure story, but like... Does everybody just assume... What are we laughing about? We're going to win. There's only one left. Ha 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 ha. We've got them. Not not G2. Uh the first law of the Vard I would like you all to know is uh use greater force against itself. Which is not entirely what happens here, because they just blow up their own ship when it's entering the docking bay or the, you know, whatever. But I guess that works. That's the other thing. He had to make all these laws. John Sales had to write all these laws of the Varda. The Varda says this, the Varda says that. Uh, I don't know if that is a, a reference to Agnes Varda, the f French New Wave filmmaker. I hope it is. Because that would be kind of cool. <laughs> if there was just, let me reference Agnes Varda. Um, whose movies are great, if you've never seen those. I don't know how he got really dirty and she didn't. But hey, hey, what do you know? It's a, it's a thing. Ah, uh, she's dirtier there. It just depends. Just depends on the scene. So, yeah, I mean, it, it just feels like that last third of the movie flies by really, really fast. And and you kind of lose characters who didn't get a chance to shine that much. That's my main concern, my main problem with this movie, which I think I've said about four times now. Um, but I do think that this this last little bit with Nell kind of sacrificing herself, but not realizing that's what she's doing because she's she still thinks that it that Shad's Zed because her memory circuits are gone. I think it's nice. I think it's a nice little goodbye. Um, because you know Nell has been the only sort of uh, mentor that Shad's had, and so I guess Nell is sort of the Obi Wan Kenobi. Boy, she's the Millennium Falcon. She's the R two D two C three PO, and she's Obi Wan Kenobi all in one. That's pretty cool. And she's got boobs. He even does it. This is a Sador of the Malmori.
I love that the doctor is doing stuff on the bridge. He's a surgeon. <laughs> Neat Tesla coil stuff. Is that what those are called? I don't remember what those are called. It's, it's a pretty nice moment for Sador. I wanted to live forever. And uh, here's what we don't have in this movie that we have in The Magnificent Seven and Star Wars and even a little bit in Seven Samurai is uh, an ending. <laughs> this uh, They've defeated them. They're kind of just like, yes, we did it. Let's think back at all the people who died. And then Shad gets to say, they served a purpose. They were They were heroes, all of them. And we shall remember them forever and then it just ends and then we're done we don't get to see what akira looks like again we don't get to see what happened i'm almost positive that spear spear throwing you know uh, loincloth guy is still down there having done his one thing he didn't die and yeah that's it we're, we're done here's the entire list of people who are in the film um so <laughs> yeah it's uh, it, the end of this movie does kind of uh, become silly. And uh, uh, Jeff Corey played uh, Zed. I was trying to think of his name the whole time. Jeff Corey was in a ton of things. And it was Julia Duffy, not Karen Duffy. I forget who is which. Um, Terrence McNally was in this film, but not the playwright Terrence McNally. Um, Battle Beyond the Stars, uh, it did okay for people. Uh, Gail Ann Hurd was also a production manager on this, which went on to great success. And it's just, it's interesting to me to look at a movie that was made by Corman when he was trying his best. He was, he was, he was actually putting in a lot of effort. I mean, he, I think Corman's a really good director, but by this time he was kind of just shrewd um, producer man, but he wanted something. He wanted a big thing. And so he put all these people who would go on to greatness. Um, Gail Ann Hurd obviously is a producer. She produced... Uh, she produces the Walking Dead series now, um, and she was just a production manager, and, and obviously James Cameron went on to be the highest grossing director of all time. Um, James Horner went on to great success, winning several Oscars for his his work. Um, Alan S. Howarth there, his special sound effects, he uh, went on to work with John Carpenter and helped write the music to Escape from New York, which is one of the highest selling soundtracks of all time. Um and John Sayles wrote a ton of that. He wrote uh, Piranha for Joe Dante. He wrote this. He wrote a couple other, I think he wrote The Howling as well. He wrote just a couple other kind of like B-movie scripts. And, and then he went on to write and direct his own films like Eight Men Out and uh, uh, Lone Star. Is that the name of that film? Um, and, you know, be a very well dis well-respected filmmaker in his own right as well. Um, and I think that that's great. I think that movies like this, that have such talent behind them, it doesn't matter that it's kind of lower, kind of B-movie, kind of silly. It doesn't quite hang together the same way. I'm sort of just like in awe of the fact that there was this one movie that had so many people working on it, uh, so many people who went on to do super good things. And, um, you know, Alec Gillis there was on the special effects crew. He was one of, uh, and the Skotak brothers, the, they've worked on countless movies that you think are good. Um, it's 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 fun. It's fun for me as a film fan to watch something like this. It's fun for me as a fan of science fiction or kind of space opera to watch something like this, which is not the top. You know what I mean? There's there's Star Wars, and we all know Star Wars and the Star Trek films, but there are other movies that deserve to be looked at too. Movies that have as much creativity in them and as much um, heart uh, as as those other movies, but just you know didn't have the budget and didn't quite get the same acclaim and i certainly i would not say that battle beyond the stars deserves to be on the higher echelon of science fiction movies of all time but i think it's good um i remember going to showing this at a movie night with friends and uh uh i don't think anybody really got it and maybe maybe i'm the only one who thinks the same way about these type of movies but that's why i like watching be science fiction especially from this era because it's just like they wanted to do something and uh and i think that that's just fun i think science fiction should be fun and could be fun doesn't always need to be dark and serious um okay so that's uh battle beyond the stars thank you all for listening to me 
prattle on for as long as I did. Hopefully that was enjoyable to you. And hopefully um, I will do more of these. Uh, I will not always just be me on the commentary. So if you get tired of listening to me, there will be other people. Um, but, you know, sometimes maybe I'll do an episode of a TV show. Maybe I'll do another movie. Maybe I'll do um, who knows what. But um, this is the show. It's going to be me and some people maybe occasionally talking about science fiction and how much it means to us and to me. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, you can get a hold of me at uh, Functional Nerd on Twitter. Thank you all for listening. And until next time, keep looking to the stars. Contact this podcast at worldsoftomorrowpod at gmail.com and twitter.com slash worlds T-M-R-R-W pod. Thank you. This concludes our transmission.